Ja, herzlich willkommen zur heutigen Diskussion. Um, the event will be held in German, but um, uh, translated into English. So please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen um, if you uh, need translation. You can choose either German and English or, or English, and we recommend to mute the original sound if you use translation. Thank you very much. Nochmals herzlich willkommen zur heutigen Buchvorstellung und Diskussion des Buches, welche Grenzen Welcome once again to today's book discussion and uh, book presentation of the book. What kind of borders do we need uh, with Gerald Knaus, uh, together with uh, Kirsten Maas, uh, the head of the Africa Department of the Heinrich Foundation. My name is Dr. Antonia not i'm the director of the international department at the heinrich Böll foundation and i'm quite happy that so many of you are present here today even though it's virtually um dear guests uh, the topic of migration is not that present anymore in the media due to the serious corona pandemic however the urgency and the short Shortcomings that we need to tackle in the migration policy uh, is uh, still there. The fact that thousands of people live on the Greek islands in a tent and in camps without access to uh, legal procedures has become a symbol for many people for the a failure of the European migration policy. And this failure continues. You uh, have surely all seen the tents underwater, the flooded tents, etc. So the fact that there are no easy answers uh, to this whole complex flight, migration, asylum is quite clear. However, it's also clear that um, uh, deterrence is not a solution. This just leads to um, fake solutions that are presented for uh, electricity or tactical reasons, so to speak. Another example for such um, decision is the uh, interior minister's uh, decision to lift the ban on deportations to Syria. This decision does not only neglect the human rights abuses in Syria, which uh, range from torture to disappearances, but it also ignores the question of an implementation because there's not uh, there's no agreement with the Assad regime and there cannot be. However, it, it's quite fitting for a migration debate which is marked by myths and prejudice uh, where at all levels uh, in society and also in the political sphere um, uh, where the different uh, uh, opinions are um, not able to, to uh, be harmonized. So uh, what's very important from our point of view is on the one hand, the analysis of the very complex and multidimensional uh, causes, underlying causes of migration as a prerequisite for the political shaping. Uh, this is what we uh, in the foundation are working on as well as many other organizations. And one result of this work is that um, the book that Kirsten Maas Albers has uh, devised, um, Oranges and Europe Taste Better. And this book is about the diverse reasons why people leave their home. And be it becomes quite clear in the book why so many concepts on the fight against the root causes of uh, migration are not successful. And on the other hand, we need a debate on possible solutions, which I dear incorporates ideas and perspectives from the original countries, the transit countries and the target countries. And this is what I liked uh, very much about your book, Mr. Knaus, that you emphasize it. And I think that the book of Gerd Knaus is um, a very important book. Um, he proposes humane but also practical solutions at the same time. And the book um, incorporates very many interesting approaches and it forces us to go beyond um, the call for solutions and to think about uh, real alternatives. And I think this is very important. Such an alternative are humane borders. What this exactly means uh, remains to be seen uh, in the course of the discussion. 
I'm quite happy that we have the opportunity today uh, to talk with you, uh, Mr. Knaus, to talk about your book, the solutions that you propose. And I'm quite sure that it's going to be a very lively discussion. I will pass the floor to Kirsten Maas and Bear, who will guide us through this discussion. And I'm looking forward to the next 90 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonia Nord, and welcome, Gerhard Knaus. I'm quite glad that you're here. We will uh, be, uh, or keep it informal as usual. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to conduct this interview today, albeit digitally. Um, we'll have the pleasure of um, talking for just under an hour. Or, uh, I will uh, show you the book. So here is, is the book. And um, I already uh, recognize that there are more than 100 participants. So you can uh, raise questions in German or in English and um, in the Q&A section. You can see the little icon at the bottom, F and A or Q&A. There you can um, raise your questions and at the end we'll try to answer them. So we will keep an eye on the time so that you can be part of the discussion. But first of all, I would like to briefly introduce the author of this book, Gerhard Knaus. He's the founder director of the Think Tank European Stability Initiatives, ESI. He is an internationally recognized expert who uh, advises governments and institutions in Europe on the issues of flight migration and human rights. He was born in Salzburg. He learned about the fall of the Berlin Wall as a student at, in Oxford. He also studied philosophy, politics and international relations, uh, amongst others, in Brussels and Bologna. And uh, later on, he taught economics at the University of Czernowitzy in Ukraine and later in Sofia and Bulgaria. Um, in Bulgaria, he dealt with the issue of visa liberalization for the first time. And as Knaus uh, wrote, a national obsession in Bulgaria, but also in the mid 90s on the Western Balkans. Gerald Knaus is also a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations and was an associate fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School, John F. Kennedy School of Governance in the United States um, for five years. In the Balkans, he experienced uh, what uh, it costs to eliminate the causes of flight. In 2004, he moved to Istanbul with his family and now he lives in Berlin, a few steps away from the former war. So almost every day he writes in his book, he crosses uh, the former wall with his bike, um, which uh, reminds uh, us of the inhumane borders of the 20th century. So welcome to you, Gerald. We want to talk a bit about uh, borders at the beginning. And already during the, the introduction, I uh, took out some aspects of uh, the last chapter of your book. So what was the most uh, relevant personal border experience. Thank you very much, Kirsten, and thank you very much to Antonia Nord and also the Bird Foundation for this opportunity. And uh, thanks to everyone who is uh, listening in. When I talk about uh, border experiences that have uh, uh, had an impact on me, I would like to show you a picture. I hope that it's gonna work. Well, um, I would like to start with this um, picture. Uh, in the year 2013, I was there, the Finnish Russian border, it's 1,300 kilometers long. And the reason why I was there is this reason, is this man, uh, Igor Leiker, the former Frontex uh, boss, he's uh, from Finland. And when I lived in Turkey, I learned that um, Finnish have most experience due to their 1,300 kilometers long border. They've gained most experience on how to humanely control uh, a lengthy border. And this border, of course, is impressive. I was there with Finnish uh, border uh, patrols. And after they explained everything to me, how great their training is, uh, and um, how they communicate, uh, how they train their dogs, and use sledges, etc. I asked them at the on the last day while we were at the border, I asked them, how 
many people have actually tried to cross the border irregularly. And he said, um, uh, in 2003, four and five, there were only 12 persons, three or four persons respectively, who tried to cross the border. And I asked them, well, why is nobody trying it? And the, re the answer was, well, this is due to the 5,000 Russian border patrols um, who are still there. Um, so nobody can come actually. And I asked them, well, what would you do with all the training and all the equipment if the Russians wouldn't do anything anymore? And if on a daily basis, two to 300 people would try to cross the border. And the answer came quite quickly. They said, well, we, would of course let people climb this uh, little um, fence, climb across this little fence because everything else would be uh, illegal. So um, what I took home is that no matter how good um, the Finnish border patrol was, uh, the number of people try to irregularly cross the border is um, uh, not important. And another quote, refugees who fly from, flee from a war uh, need to be able to seek asylum. And um, the head of Frontex said, or well, today's Frontex boss says, well, Frontex task is to register those who want to come so that they can apply for asylum. So Frontex is not um, pushing anyone back. And this is actually my main experience from this border. If uh, European Border Patrol will uh, stick to the law, will comply with the regulations, then they cannot push back anyone. Um, and maybe one second remark at the Upper Rhine, I was there uh, at the invitation of a uh, member of the German parliament, and there's this bridge at Rheinfelden. And this bridge can be crossed without any uh, uh, passing any controls. Um, and uh, I also was in Lörrach, um, and there's a museum which was quite interesting, which uh, is next to the canton Basel. And in this museum there in Lörrach, the dramatic story of this German-Swiss border uh, in the 20th century is being uh, described. And um, the former head of the Swiss uh, foreigners police, uh, his name was Ortmund. He tried to uh, stop every irregular migration to Switzerland in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and he also wanted to uh, deport people and later on a fence was built by Himmler who remained there for a few years. And this is my second lesson. So this experience um, the, in the German Swiss border region shows the second thing that is very important. If border patrol does not comply with law, if they use violence, then they can stop every regular migration with violence. And this is exactly what happened in Switzerland. Even though there was half a million Jews in 1938 who were forced to flee, <coughs> <clears throat> By the end of the war in Switzerland, only 2,000 Jews um, had uh, arrived or had tried to migrate to Switzerland. So if Switzerland would have taken in as many Jews as others have uh, taken in um, Syrian refugees, then uh, all those uh, Jews could have been saved. So thank you very much. Um, this uh, brings me to the second aspect. Let us furthermore talk about the experience of um, frontiers, of borders, especially external borders. 
which gets me to Moria, the refugee camp. We've heard about it and we've seen the images, the pictures almost daily. <clears throat> we see what happens on the islands of Greece. People are put together in miserable conditions. They are suffering from diseases. We are seeing this day by day without trying to find a solution. We know that this is a policy of deterrence. This is meant to make people refrain from coming here. It's pure calculation instead, in spite of the miserable conditions which are unchanged and tolerated. Now you write in your foreword, it's high time because there is an emergency out there at the European borders. And then in your book, you also write about Switzerland. And you talk about the Australian approach. You explain the, America, the Australian um, policy over the last decades. Tell us, please. The Australian history is not really known in Europe. People who deal with migration have heard of it. But tell us, please, why is this a relevant story for us looking at the external outer borders? Now the answer is what in what you said at the beginning, we see the borders in Lesbos, Samos, but also in Croatia, at the Hungarian, Serbian border, but also in North Africa and Melia and other places. What we see goes far beyond the brutality of the so-called Australian solution. And yet I focus on the Australian example in my book, because it's important to understand what the situation is in is like in Europe today. Now, the Australian solution became known globally in 2013. It had been implemented, the system, the Australian system had been implemented in 2001 already, and it had existed from 2001 to 2007, but then the no way campaign of the Australian government was launched. And I'm telling the story in my book. And so that you better understand, I give the example of Abdel Aziz Mohammed, born in a refugee camp, who in 2013 managed to take a boat from Indonesia in order to get to the Christmas Islands, which are part of Australia. He wanted to study medicine. He lives in Switzerland today. But when he was caught from uh, of the, the boat on his way to Australia, he had to decide to either return to Sudan, which is where he originally came from, or to stay on a little island in Papua New Guinea. And a policy adopted by the Australian government in the summer of 2013 was implemented with the help of Greg Hunt. That's the man you see on the picture. And he explained what the intention was. The intention was that as of the summer of 2013, all who would arrive would be brought to camp so that their will to stay would be killed. Naguru and Manus are the two islands which were used. So it's PNG and Nagu is an independent state and the uh, island of Manus is part of PNG. So the idea was to make these islands available, so to speak, for a low number of people and several thousands arrived by boat and they were brought to the islands and they were kept there for years. 
an Australian psychiatrist who used to work there called it torture later. It was torture indeed. Now see the fingers, see the numbers in order to understand what this policy was about. Two camps, 3,000 3, people, 14 suicides. Now I'm describing this particular policy in my book. This was about convincing people to refrain from coming. This policy cost 600 million euros per year after 2012. A sum which corresponded to the cost for the whole Australian um, judicial system per year. <clears throat> and that's hard to imagine for someone who might stay in a hotel room looking over the harbour of Sydney. Now, the result of this investment was no irregular, irregular arrivals anymore, hardly any dead people. In previous years, about 50,000 people per year, sorry, in previous years, about 50,000 people had arrived. Now, for the first time, Australia relied on this policy already in 2001. At the time, they also brought people to Nagoro and this almost immediately stopped the uh, people from coming. It was a policy of deterrence and there was a lot of criticism at the time already. Now, this policy ended in 2007 because the Labour Party had promised in the election campaign that the camps would be closed. Kevin Rudd used to be the Prime Minister. He said, it's inhumane, Australia doesn't do this and I will close the camps once I'm elected. And that's what he did. And in the years to follow, 50,000 people came. There were terrible accidents. People saw them on television terrible accidents just before Christmas on the Christmas islands, for example. And people tried to find a way to manage migration. That's at least what the Labour government, what the Labour Party did. And at the end, Kevin Rudd closed the camps. They were reopened in 2012. And then in 2013, just before the next elections, they decided to bring everybody who would arrive in Australia by boat would be brought to these islands. Now for seven years, the Labour Party, which had had this uh, complete change of policy undertaken and the Conservative Liberal Party who had always been in favor of this policy, support this policy, the promise was made to reduce migration. Tony Abbott, Abbott won his elections. Morrison, the now prime minister, used to be the minister in charge of refugees before, and he is the responsible man for the system implemented in 2013. Now, what's the lesson to be learned? Now, the first lesson is if a party promises to implement a humane policy, but doesn't have solutions, there is a major risk that this policy will be given up soon. That's the example of Mr. Rudd. This is what Matteo Renzi did in Italy. Mare Nostrum is the name of the Italian program in 2017. He was very much in favor of policy of collaboration with the militia. That's what Bill Clinton did when he criticized George W. Bush for pushing back people from the boats who came from Haiti. And then when he became president, he did the same. Sebastian Kunz also reminded us of uh, the Australian case in 2017, right? Viktor Orban also was very much in favor. Now, a few years ago, 
it was only the right wing who was in favor of this policy, but now you have many more who are in favor. Poland would be another example. Now, the lessons. One lesson is it's extremely dangerous to just criticize an inhumane policy without having a solution because the potential, the possible result would be a change of a new policy. Tsipras is another example. He also criticized the um, refugee policy of the past and now he has closed his own borders or the borders of his own country. No refugees can arrive from Turkey anymore. So what can be done? Yeah. I mean, there was a time, and here you see the figures in the 1970s, where several hundred people arrived in Australia by boat. And after 1982, nobody arrived anymore. Malcolm Fraser is the man you would want to see. He used to be the prime minister. And he is the one who is praised most from all governments in the last decades. He was the one who did the best policy, people will say. What did he do? He said, we need to be in control. But in order to get control, we need collaboration, cooperation. So he relied on cooperation with the transit countries. So he sent his ministers to Malaysia and Indonesia and said, no, if you keep people from taking a boat, we'll accept a huge number of refugees from the camps in Malaysia. The result was there were hardly any boats anymore, but Australia committed to accepting 10,000 of people, 180,000 people finally could settle in Australia. Nobody was treated badly. That was the policy of the 1980s. This was not a contravention of the Refugee Convention. And the question is why didn't it work in the last round? In 2011, Julia Dillard, also representing the Labour Party, tried the same. She tried to agree with Malaysia. So the idea was to send people who would arrive from Malaysia back to Malaysia, and there would be the support of the UNHCR. And it would be a coordinated system so that Malaysia at the end would be able to send many more people to Australia. The idea was good, but Malaysia didn't want to sign the uh, refugee convention. And of course you need to cooperate with a country that would guarantee the human rights. So that's why it didn't work. She tried to do what Fraser had done 20 years earlier. So it did not fail in the beginning, but it eventually failed in Parliament when the Labour Party wanted to adopt a law. And it also failed because there was a coalition of the right wing who said, we don't want to take anyone from Malaysia in. Nobody should come to Australia. The Green Party, who in Australia said it's inhumane to send people back. There is no guarantee that they will be treated better there than here. Mm -hmm. So there was no Malaysia plan at the time. And a year later, Kevin Rudd implemented the island solution, which shows that in spite of the many horrible pictures we see online, in spite of the many books and films that are written and made, in spite of the fact that we know that the people are not well off, the Australian policy has not changed. And that's certainly one of the lessons we have to learn because what happened in Australia then is happening in Europe today. We do see Hungary, Croatia, and many more countries, may, maybe Spain soon, where people have the impression that the only option to overcome uncontrolled crossings of our borders is deterrence. No open borders anymore. Nobody wants them anymore. Also the British ministers criticize the former approach. The Australians sent military ships in order to push the people back to Indonesia. That's what's happening 
what's happening here too, which means we need alternatives which get a majority, which find a majority. This is what we will have to talk about. Because otherwise we run the risks that um, we will even surpass Australia in terms of brutality. So what Europe uh, has been doing is uh, um, not, uh, we, we shouldn't uh, focus on the human rights courts because the uh, human rights court is already um, changing its decision. So pushbacks in Spain were considered by the court as legal. So last item, the resettlement in Australia. So the uh, taking in of uh, refugees it was part of um, an international program. And we should remember this because at the time in Southeast Asia, or actually it started in 1979, until 1997, 2.2 million refugees were taken in, in a legal form uh, brought to other countries. Jimmy Carter started it, but also other American presidents continue. So in this regard, we do see alternatives even today to not violate the right to asylum. However, we need co cooperation for it. We need legal pathways and we have to fight against a political trap in which pushbacks, brutality, deterrence through inhumane treatment lead to majorities in our democracies in uh, Western countries and even seem without any alternative. So let's talk about this kind of policy, which is obviously supported by the uh, majority of people and uh, which leads to more brutality at the border. And uh, your book also describes it very uh, deep in a very detailed way. So Western Europe after the Second World War was marked by this commitment to human dignity. as a basis of the moral re-foundation of uh, Western Europe. Um, the question is, is this being supported uh, still? And um, we see how it is under undermined and also violated nowadays. And uh, for example, if we tolerate the number of people who die in the Mediterranean or in Sahara, and in your book, you write a lot about Viktor Orban, who, uh, proclaims completely different ideas, uh, like uh, Rudd or other uh, Australian interior ministers who say illegal or irregular migration should not be met with empathy. And, and Victor Orban also says, uh, no empathy, but uh, shutting yourself off and there will be less people dying in the Mediterranean. So do we want to act like that? Is it um, conceivable that Europe loses its moral compass that this um, exceptional state at the borders becomes a normal state and how could we uh, prevent that? Well, then in September of 2015, Viktor Orban, just two days after the death of Alan Cody in Bobham, gave a speech and presented a strategy. Europe, he was still quite isolated in Europe. Um, so if you compare his speech in September 2015 to the uh, Commission President Juncker's speech uh, at the time, full of empathy, Europe is prepared to help, we have to realize nowadays that Orban has actually asserted itself. Um, so what Europe is doing today at the external borders is what Donald Trump uh, wants to do. Um, in, in Croatia, there have been pushbacks for years. Um, and uh, they are being beaten, they end up in hospital, and what we see at the Turkish external borders, we know that already, and we know uh, how um, people are treated in the Mediterranean, and um, there are too many people dying still. And a, quote, a friend sent me a quote from a Spanish politician from the Partido Popular, uh, Pablo Casado, the party head, uh, said about the people who arrived on the Canary Islands, so where um, many thousands of people arrived uh, recently, and he said, well, deportations should be the main tool uh, in our toolbox. We should not deal with prolonged uh, asylum processes. 
because he said that um, the Spanish government cannot deal with all the people applying for asylum. Uh, most of the asylum seekers are from Senegal and other countries uh, and are not entitled to asylum. Um, and of course, human dignity calls for, for empathy. We should not uh, push them back, but obviously this is not enough. So many democracies throughout the world are using pushbacks and have used them for decades. And the United States have used them um, in terms of the votes coming from Haiti. 200,000 people were pushed back by the US. So the, to ratify the Geneva Convention is not sufficient or to, to um, emphasize empathy is not sufficient. And there are only two alternatives. Because we fear a lack of control or losing control, but just take a look at Australian politicians. The Australian politicians say two things. They say, you, Europeans are hypocrites. But in fact, your policy is way more brutal. With you, between 2014 and 2018, in the central Mediterranean, 15,000 people have died. And here in Australia, nobody has died. Well, of course, we brought um, several thousand people to the islands, and they aren't in a good position. Um, and the Australians say we should not show empathy. Um, but they say, well, you Europeans, you pretend to be empathic, but uh, you let people die in the Mediterranean, because the only real alternative, which is opening the border where nobody would die in the end, uh, is, is not a desired solution. So your policy of, of, of empathy is actually a hypocrisy. And this is what the Australians say. And this is, mm, I mean, this is supported by people. And this is also what Frontex says. Well, Frontex is not allowed to say this openly, and in Europe, this is still illegal. So there are courts in Europe who say what the Australians are doing to, to treat the individual mm -hmm. in a way so that they can deter others. So this means violating human dignity of the individual. Um, I mean, there are enough opportunities. I mean, I've been talking to many officials of uh, international organizations, also in Greek, and say, um, of course, we could all uh, allocate them in hotels. We have uh, sufficient hotel rooms. And, um, and also, of course, the policy of deterrence is very expensive. The UNHCR has been uh, given uh, 37 million euros uh, for different camps. And of course, the UNHCR could uh, solve the problem if we wanted to, but uh, we don't want them to solve it. And this, however, this policy is illegal because uh, in Europe, we still have court rulings of the Human Rights Court uh, 2012 and time and again uh, rulings of the European Court of Justice in the case of hung Hungary, um, for example, to say, well, treating people like that is inhumane and it's not in line with the European Basic Rights Charter, but uh, courts worldwide, the Supreme Court in the United States, the High Court in Australia and courts in other democracies have, after a certain period of time, legitimize these pushbacks. And the European Court of uh, uh, Human Rights is actually on this path. We just have to take a look at the, its decisions. So the real bastion against the legalization and uh, normalization of pushbacks and reformment is the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg in the EU. So how long can it still maintain this uh, position? And what does it do if Hungary uh, simply ignores the rulings, because if they do it, other states will complain, and then will we see a certain kind of um, getting used to it? So, I mean, there's so many rescues at sea who are being supported by others. There's cities taking on people. There's also uh, the German Bundestag. Um, who decided against the inhumane treatment of children at the external borders, but what does the Germans do? What does Germany do if there is no um, call from Greece to uh, uh, take over some of the refugees? Uh, or if the Spanish government says, well, we do not want to transfer these migrants from the Canary Islands, so uh, deterrence is the only means. Well, let's look at Germany um, in concrete terms. So Germany, as we all know, has uh, made quite considerable contributions since 2015, 2016. Uh, many people who were seeking protection uh, could, 
came to Germany and Germany uh, took them in. And um, at the same time, we also made a huge contribution to the humanitarian refugee aid by uh, large contributions to the UNHCR, where we are actually um, um, leading. So there's lack of agreement among the member states and Europe um, where the Orbans and others uh, are actually getting support by the, their population for the strict uh, deterrence. So does Germany have a key role here? Can we make a contribution that others cannot make? Um, and don't we have the opportunity or missed out the opportunity rather with our EU presidency? I mean, these were six months that, um, and this is what Zeofa actually uh, set out as an objective that we could uh, have come to a more concrete solution. So does Germany have a um, key role to play or what role could Germany play in the future? Well, maybe to summarize it, uh, the crisis that we are facing is that the refugee situation or the, the regulations rather are no longer being respected. So pushbacks are a daily reality at the external borders and deterrence serves this objective. And now the question is, how can we achieve a turnaround? How can we actually maintain an idea that was clearly enshrined in the Geneva Convention in 1951 to push back no one. And uh, of course, it's also part of the basic rights charter of, of Europe. So who, who could do something about it? And of course, some of the countries have a key role to play. Not only the Germans dislike what is happening at the moment. It's not only the Germans who have acted over the past years. Uh, if you look at the capita uh, relationship, then Sweden has provided uh, most protection or protection to most people. Um, like. Japan, uh, China, Korea, India, and other countries with almost 10 billion inhabitants. Uh, so Sweden has provided more uh, protection to refugees than all the other countries altogether. Because, but Germany plays a special role because Germany is a very big country. And in terms of asylum, uh, the idea that everyone is entitled to uh, apply for asylum and to undergo a due process, well, Germany is is actually in the lead. Um, the BAM is the biggest uh, um, office here and um, uh, more than 1 million people um, get subsidiary protection in Germany and uh, the UNHCR and other organizations are mainly predominantly dependent on the funding by the US, which is uh, ironic, and also Germany. And this provides a certain uh, credibility to Germany, but uh, Germany has not only taken in many refugees, many people, however, quite visible in front of the world, Germany has provided protection and provided shelter to, to many migrants, but the politicians have not um, lost their power. Uh, despite that fact, this is what uh, people in Australia or, or Sebastian Kurz has said. Well, if you do this, um, like me, uh, hardline, uh, closing borders, then you will uh, win the election. But Germany says, well, if there's a consensus of several parties of the century who support it and to, um, and to take in people, then in the end, of course, there might be an, a surge of right and populists, but they are still much weaker than in all the neighboring countries. Also from a political point of view, this is a very important message. So, so the question is, what is Germany doing with this um, capital, so to speak? And um, the role of key actors like the US or Germany is very important here. So um, the US said, or asked in 19, uh, 38, how can we help half a million Jews? They invited other countries, help, uh, invited democracies. Um, and um, they said, well, we have done enough. Uh, we want to help, but we've done enough. So at the end of this conference, everyone hid behind the back of the others. So the British said, well, we already did enough. We did, can do more. And the French said, well, we also did enough and we can do more. So at the end, Evian was a clear disaster. And the second conference in Southeast Asia, in 1979 was quite the opposite. So the US came and 
wanted to protect the rights of refugees. Tens of thousands uh, were in camps, like similar to Moria, but even worse in Malaysia. Uh, and Malaysia said, well, we're going to shoot them. We were going to push them back using violence and the US invited together with the United Nations and HCR and said, okay, we will take in more than 100,000 refugees over the next two years uh, up until this uh, refugee stream stops. So we will help these people from the camps. So this is uh, the point of time when Australia, Canada, Switzerland uh, followed suit. Now, what is the political question for Germany today? The strategy needs to be everybody needs to cooperate. Otherwise, we won't move. Or we can go and say we won't have others determine our agenda. We do what we deem necessary. I mean, the UN General Assembly was in favor of support with the exception of Trump and Orban, two votes against 181 in favor of a global pact for refugees, 100 destinations and concrete details concerning what needs to be done, like more countries in the world need to be involved. I mean, it cannot be that only 30 countries in the world work in order to implement this global pact. But we need coalitions in order to get involved and Germany could move forward. I mean, we'll talk about concrete ideas in a minute, but I would like to remind you that it's extremely dangerous to believe that nothing could be done or nothing more could be done unless all are participating. Well, Sweden has offered more protection than many other countries in the world, you say in your book. Remarkable, I'd say. But I would like to come back to Germany and Europe and I would like us to focus on Europe because this is about concrete steps the EU has not even managed to adopt a counter proposal by adopting the migration pact. Migration pact is not an alternative option. So maybe we need to tell a story like the one you told about Australia in order to show what alternative options there are and what humane solutions there are. Oh, that's what you try to sketch in your book. And that's what I would like to ask you to spend the rest of our time here before we answer the questions we see in the chat already by talking about concrete solutions. Because you also make proposals in your book. You say that Europe should be a lighthouse, a beacon for humane refugee policies. You propose a triad for Europe consisting of fast and fair asylum procedures, deportation realism and deadline rules, and migration diplomacy, more legal mobility, resettlement, and sponsorship for refugees. That's the triad, that's the three elements of your proposal and I would like to briefly tackle each and every of these proposals because it sounds nice, fast and fair asylum procedures. I mean, what does it mean? Why do we need faster procedures and how can we make sure that these are fair and diligent and proper? Other examples to show that it works. And please be brief so that we have time for the Q&A session. Yeah, right, I will be brief and I give more details in my book. And of course, I'm very interested in concrete proposals. Let me give you an example. The Canary Islands, very topical today, 18 to 20,000 people are arriving there. I haven't seen the exact numbers but I rely on Spanish media, many are from Morocco. 
and other North African countries, which corresponds to the bulk of refugees who have arrived in the last three years. So far, they have not applied for asylum because Spain does not deport, i.e. we have a magnet, he or she who manages to get over the fence to Melilla or Ceuta is almost here, which means that the Spanish very much rely on deterrence together with the countries of origin who are called upon to just take those people back, bring them somewhere. There are no asylum procedures there. Asylum procedures, yeah. So there are people who arrive and then there are Australian methods in order to push them back. Question, what do we do? What could Germany do? What could a green German minister of the interior do in view of what is happening on the Canary Islands today? Now, let's assume she arrives in Madrid. She could go and say, we could send back those who do not need protection. It doesn't make sense that young Moroccans risk their lives, although their life is not at stake or at risk at home by trying to get to Spain. And there are numerous examples. So we need to be able to send those who do not need protection back. But this requires a we need to know who needs protection, i.e. we need procedures Two, If it takes three years to determine whether someone needs protection or not, it doesn't make sense. Three, we need uh, the Moroccan cooperation so that Morocco takes people back. Let me ask you a question, which is really fitting. I see it in the chat. Now, Someone asked, why are you talking about irregular migration in spite of the fact that history has shown us that we have to talk about refugees, pure refugees, pure and proper. I mean, how do you differentiate between irregular refugees and refugees, pure and proper, flüchtende and irregular refugees in Germany? Now, the right-wing populists don't like people in Europe who don't look as if they were the um, belonging to the family of the Celts. They just look different and that's why they don't want them here. But irregular refers to the fact that people enter Europe without having a visa. And among those irregular migrants, we need to have the migrants or the refugees commission decide who is to be sent back or not. I mean, you don't see it when looking at the faces of the people. A Moroccan might also need protection. He's uh, politically persecuted or has other reasons why he or she needs international protection. So we need to distinguish without this distinction we don't need asylum procedures. That's what Orban says. He doesn't have any asylum procedures anymore. He says, we either accept them all or we send them all back. And his, his proposal is of course to send them all back. So we need fair trials, fair procedures. What would be a fair procedure? Now we look at the best authorities of the world, which truly follow the guidelines serious guidelines for the decision about whether someone needs protection or not, where the translation works, where you can rely on the translators, which doesn't work always. And there are many countries in Europe where the system has failed so far. You also need a qualified system in terms of qualified people who implement it. And you also need legal consultancy for the people concerned. This would be a fair asylum process procedure, which requires resources. Now, human rights organizations remind us that if 2000 people arrive on the islands per month, it's hard to believe that Europe cannot make the resources 
available that are needed in order to carry out fair procedures. I mean, procedures that take you three years. It's the case in Italy, in Spain. It also took very long in Germany in the first instance for a long time until recently. Now, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, who looks at the individual case? Sometimes it's just an hour or 90 minutes. So people wait for ages, for years, and eventually someone looks at their case and decides within an hour or so. So the quality of the procedure is not in whether it's a quick or one or not. It depends on the resources and the challenges for Europe. The only chance to save the refugee system. And let me remind you once again, Germany and some of the neighbors have taken 40% of all positive asylum decisions of the world in the last seven years. So if there are no, no more countries to get involved, we won't have a refugee system in the world in the long run, which does mean, which, which means we need to uh, co-capacitate other countries, right? Like with respect to asylum procedures um, involving the Greek islands or Spain. Now the deportation, realism you mentioned isn't this a rhetoric danger you say deportation realism is a, a solution now doesn't that get you into a close proximity to those who say we don't want to have those people here Anyway, people tend to remind us that people are obliged to leave and at the right wing, they are criticizing the authorities for not implementing this rule. So what does deportation realism mean? Do you want to increase the number of people who are being deported? No, not at all. The contrary is true. A deportation is always a human tragedy for tragedy for the deported. It's also extremely difficult for those who deport. I talked to lots of police officers. And it's also a major problem for the receiving countries or the countries of origin. So we need a system which has as low numbers of deportation as possible. Now, the ministers of the interior tell us all the time, including in Germany, every person who has to go should go. Now that's the legal situation, but to be realistic means that we need to adopt mythologies which are against the human dignity in order to do this. I mean, that's what Trump tried to do in the US, but we cannot do this in Europe. Or if we do it, we lose our civilization after World War II, i.e. our very nature would be given up. So we need to try to have low numbers of people being deported. But we have to deport those who don't need protection here, which means we need to enhance the asylum system. We need to capacitate the judges, and that's my plea. I'm telling lawyers, work on a concept which is as realistic as possible in order to help Spain, Malta, Ceuta implement an asylum system within weeks. Because this is the only possibility we have in order to do something about the pushback, which is being proposed by many these days. I would like to pick up once again what Antonia has uh, touched upon, and this uh, would also bring us to the end of our discussion part. Well, ban on deportation for certain groups of peoples from certain conflict situations in certain countries. So now for Syria, the ban was lifted. Uh, we fought for Afghanistan, uh, the ban uh, for quite a long time. Why can't Germany say general ban on deportations for Syrians, for Afghans? So what do you think about the lifting of this ban? Well, if we want to achieve something that the government uh, 
and federal states where the Greens are in power, uh, Hessen, Baden-Württemberg, Schleswig-Holstein or others, or maybe a future German government. So if we want to achieve something uh, of which uh, the Greens could also convince a coalition partner, then we should focus on deportation realism. This means the idea that those who have already arrived from Gambia, Senegal, other countries, and who have been in Germany for years, um, it's, it's simply not possible that we'll be able to deport them. The figures just so uh, it. In the first six months of this year, Germany deported approximately 1,000 people to countries outside of uh, Europe uh, in the first six months. And uh, throughout the 2019, it was approximately 2,000 per six months and predominantly to three countries, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. But it's, it's similar in, in Italy and in Spain and in Greece. And it's so unsuccessful because we don't use the same methods as other, other countries in the world. So if we wanna be realistic, then we have to say, it doesn't make sense to leave people in this insecurity. Actually, we should, provide security to those who have already arrived and who are here and to, um, uh, we should offer them, uh, them, we should offer them a perspective. And um, this holds also true for green politicians. I mean, this can only be implemented if this does not mean that all the people from Gambia or Nigeria who are in Italy today, take the train to come to Germany because they think they get regular status in Germany. Um, and are treated well in Italy, uh, you don't get anything as a recognized refugee. Uh, so what we need is also a strategy that is being supported by a political majority, which says that from a certain deadline on, we will not send back anyone um, who has already arrived, because only then uh, a re location uh, according to quotas or, or integration is possible at all. So in 2016, 2017, 18, so there were 18 months where different European countries took in 20,000 people, a regular relocation from the mainland. They did not have to go via the Balkans. So <clears throat> since the recent emergence of the crisis at the external borders, the Greek are no longer interested in sending refugees to anyone else because um, they fear that more people might come. They're unable to control their uh, own borders. And this is the um, idea of the Tsipras government and also the, the uh, next government. So what they want to do is uh, deportation as quickly as possible. Of course, only after a just uh, process. And how do these processes look like? Well, in many countries in the world, um, asylum processes are like a farce. Um, however, Germany can show how it can work. Um, it should actually um, make the case for asylum systems. And uh, those who have been in the country for many years already, and this is what I mean by uh, wrong um, realism, uh, we should tell them that they can stay. And um, it wouldn't make sense to deport them. Um, so this brings me to the last part of the solution that you suggest, the migration diplomacy. So you brought up Gambia as a country several times and you also co-devised the Gambia plan with, um, which includes the repatriations and also the returns. And it's a um, poor country that is trying to build up a democracy with a very young population. And um, this uh, leads us to the topic of legal pathways. I mean, it could go on to discuss with you for hours, but uh, there are very concrete questions in our Q&A section. And this is why I would like to <clears throat> bring up one of these questions. One is mentioned, is written in English.
Well, I would like to answer you in German if possible. Yes, of course, because we have uh, the interpreters here. I just read out the English question. Well, this is actually one of the main questions and I hope that next year will bring about some changes and Germany might play a key role here. So I do hope that even before the Bundestag elections, as many parties as possible will pick up the following in their programs. Well, we want to put this talk about legal paths into concrete projects. We want to make some suggestions here. And one suggestion might be that um, we take seriously what is mentioned in the Global Compact for Refugees. We want more resettlement of people who need protection and that they are not or do not have to rely on smugglers and on risking their lives. There have never been as few resettlements of people who need protection as this year. Of course, we have Corona, but even last year, there were hardly any resettlements of people who need protection. Less than half uh, compared to the figures of 2016 and no comparison to the 1980s and the crisis in Southeast Asia. So if Germany said, well, we want to build a coalition together with other countries who are already active in this regard. So Canada is the country with most resettlements of refugees worldwide. And this should actually be our ideal. So every year, Canada is taking in 30,000 refugees legally and they have developed a system for it um, and it's not taking years like in the US of course the US have um, lowered their, their numbers they've reduced it uh, but once again they are talking about 120,000 refugees um, and over the next year uh, and Canada 30,000 and if Germany and France and the northern European countries would take in um, a similar number like Canada, nothing utopian, but similar figures like Canada. And if, in addition, we would also get the support of citizens, of churches, of municipalities, if we had a system uh, with sponsorships, for example, where people can say, well, of course, we can take in someone from Lesbos, from Moria, from Turkey, from Libya, or from some other place who is already a recognized uh, refugee uh, and we are going to support that person. Uh, so this resettlement project on the anniversary of the refugee convention, Geneva convention, would actually be a milestone. And uh, in summer, I would like to see Trudeau, Merkel, Biden, the Swedish, the French, uh, who could say, well, we, upon the world. And don't forget, in 2016, there was this great compact. So now we are going to show that there are legal pathways for refugees. This would, is something that I would like to see. Well, there are some cities in Germany who have long said, well, we're going to take in persons, we're going to take in refugees, we are prepared. So, well, but the discussion is wrong. We are not talking about it as part of a concept. It, I mean, the interior minister sometimes seems as if, and he's not the only one in Germany, I mean, there are other parties that uh, support him, um, but he seems as if uh, he thinks that if Berlin took in 2,000 people and North Rhine-Westphalia takes in 5,000 people, or Nuremberg, uh, 500 people, then this is actually an opening of gates and these gates could never ever be closed again and more people would come but Canada shows that this is simply not true it doesn't have to be that way if German cities and federal states and churches would be given the opportunity every year on their own initiative to say okay we're going to do something and the um the the federal government, but also the EU could provide funding. So these support networks are a huge asset. The preparedness is available in Germany and there are capacities in different cities. If the city said, well, we want to do something and the federal government said, okay, 0.05% of the population like in Canada for sponsorships. Um, then in Germany, it would be more than 40,000 people per year, it would be 80 times the current pilot project for 500 people, the so-called nest uh, by the interior ministry and the bump and others. So 40,000 people could then be resettled. 
And if the federal government uh, would accept an additional 20,000, so in Canada, the, the government, federal government is responsible for one third, um, then we would have a system that could work. And in Canada, it's a highly popular program because um, many people in the population are linked to this program. Everyone knows someone who's connected to the program. It's not only the state who is responsible for it. Okay. Now uh, we get more and more Q and A's here, or Q's rather. <laughs> um, does this mean that uh, we could only bring in people who are entitled to protection, who have undergone an asylum process, or do we uh, pick up people from the Greek islands where there have not yet been any asylum processes, or uh, who is entitled um, to these legal pathways? Well, legal pathways for refugees or people who need shelter makes or oh, there is the prerequisite that the people need protection well Canada has completely different channels channel for migration and channel for refugees because in terms of migration it means who do the Canadians want to take in they have a credit system point or based on certain points or credits, and they think about who they want to take in. The resettlement program is for refugees, and there it's not about a cost-benefit calculation, and there um, there's the possibility for the civil society in Canada to, to take part. And there are more and more countries willing to copy the Canadian system, but if Germany would take the first step, it would be really electrifying for others. And I have all the figures in my book, so over the past seven years, Luxembourg has taken in as many refugees uh, recognized by the UNHCR uh, more than a uh, whole Southeast Asia. Um, however, we do need to assess the, uh, the, the, pro the protection that is needed by people. So we do have to uh, assess whether they are real uh, refugees. Um, so, as you've touched upon Canada, I mean, we have, or oh, in Greece rather, we have a high recognition quote, I think approximately 70% of the Afghans in Greece get uh, uh, a refugee status, so they are recognized refugees. So, one could say that instead of waiting for them to get an incentive to move on from Greece due to the maltreatment, we could also pick them up. But we could also take in refugees from Lebanon or other countries. Why do they have to go on a boat? Um, so and if we did that, we would send out a signal that we have more control and that we get out of this uh, pendulum uh, movement um, where we have uh, the control for a short period of time then we lose control and then back again so and I was on a TV debate by the way with Sebastian Kurz recently and Sebastian Kurz says that uh, they do not want to take in anybody from the Greek islands because we need to turn I mean this is not what he said this is what I thought he said well if we just took in one child and more people would come and the problem is that now we have the Greens in the Austrian government but so far they were unable to change the course of this policy policy of their coalition well I've got a concrete question because it's also in our Q&A section is there the possibility of a uh, solution for the Aegeus. I mean, the, the old um, projects or, or suggestions have failed. We know the deadline regulation, then the review procedure, then um, uh, bringing back people. I mean, uh, this has failed because the uh, asylum procedures um, are too lengthy and uh, nobody was taken back from none of the two sides so the whole construct is uh, i mean people were taken back so uh, please tell your uh, side of the story well i mean my question my question is is there a solution um or I mean, the first thing that we have to state is that uh, very many people are on the greek islands at the moment we know that they 
are recognized refugees um, in these horrible camps and everyone has to leave uh, uh, these camps. The situation is there is, uh, there is horrible and this is exactly what the Australians have said about um, their camps, camps in Papua New Guinea and others, for example. Everyone should be evacuated here. And of course we could um, take in the 10 or 20,000 people from those islands. We could evacuate them if we wanted to. And of course, we can only do so if we show Greece a way what will happen next, because what um, uh, the politicians in Greece say that, okay, if you take in uh, several thousand people, however, the same number of people will uh, reach us uh, again, then are you going to take them in as well? And um, of course, uh, I mean, we could say we'll take in everybody, but no one's going to do that. No interior minister is going to do that. Um, and if we say, well, we're going to take in everyone who uh, is a recognized refugee, then Greece will say, okay, great, but how about the others? So uh, this is actually the idea of many countries in the Mediterranean, that they will end up with all those who are not recognized refugees, who will not be taken in by others. So this means that we need a real answer. This means we have to support refugees in Turkey. We have to cooperate with Turkey so that everyone who does, get, does not get a status is taken back. But this means that we need guarantees from Turkey, how people are treated there. And uh, the UNHCR even achieved to do this um, in, in Vietnam. This is just a mere question of your will. And of course, we should also compensate Turkey for the people um, that they've taken in or taken back. But everyone who comes should get a fair procedure. Uh, of course, in Turkey, they do not get a fair procedure. So we cannot simply send them back and say, well, you are responsible for this procedure. Um, we have to do this and we have to uh, check whether they are uh, persecuted, etc. But all in all, we need a plan that is convincing to Greece, uh, not only the government, um, um, but also the population. And um, if we don't manage to do this, then we can read as many uh, reports as we want to uh, read or write, and then the situation in Greece will not change, as well not the situation in, in Croatia or Bosnia. And then in the end, we will have many court rulings uh, banning it or condemning it um, for a certain period of time, but they will not be implemented until the courts change their rulings. And this is actually the extreme danger that we are facing. So, so we need a solution, and it would be best if we would uh, resettle a larger number of um, people from Turkey, family reunions, everyone who uh, we cannot send back. And however, we should at the same time explain in Germany that this is part of a concept where we do not leave or lose control. Right. I mean, Turkey is being left alone. No payments are being made anymore, right? The Global Compact for Refugees says that the most important goal is to help the countries that accept refugees first. If Syrians can send their children to school in Turkey, if Syrians have a chance in Jordania, in Jordan, to truly settle instead of sitting in camps, for ages. I mean, the global compact, the global pact clearly describes what needs to be done. I'm a member of the commission of the federal government dealing with the reasons of flight. I mean, we need a clear message for the countries that are the first destinations of refugees so that these countries know they get help in order to overcome a situation in which refugees are being kept in camps for ages so that children can go to school. The compact we did for Jordan should also be done for others and it should be a guarantee for at least 10 years. What about migration diplomacy? What about the external borders? 
of the EU. I mean, if refugees are being sent back there, does it hurt Europe less? Now, right now, the Turkish public is shocked because of how Europe deals with them. They are quoting Der Spiegel, the Süddeutsche newspaper, when Germany talk about, talks about Moria and Lesbos, the Turks read it too. And they say, well, they want to set an example on what? So it's a shame, the signal which is being sent out in terms of how do we deal with refugees is a shame. And this needs to be changed in the next two years. If we rely on the Australian solution, Europe will lose its credibility also with respect to the values which are still enshrined in our rights. One of my proposals in the book deals with Morocco. We deal with Morocco, we agree as follows. We tell the Moroccans that we offer them what we offer to the Balkan states or Ukraine. If you go and set up an asylum system in Morocco, if you accept to take back the ones we send back, we are the ones who decide who's being sent back, but you accept them. Cooperation in different fields and the human rights, no torture in Morocco, which needs to be checked. Now, if you guarantee all this, we guarantee help. So Moroccans and Tunisians can travel freely until, uh, as they could, until the mid 80s or to Italy, they even got until the early 1990s. So if you do this, we can send people back who don't need protection in the EU and we'll accept more people. Is this utopian? Not at all. That's what the US administration offered to Cuba in 1995, legal ways to be a refugee from Cuba. The numbers dropped year by year, but every year 20,000 Cubans could get to the US and stay. Is it realistic? I think so. The ministers of the interior in Europe should agree on such a system. Ukraine is poorer than Morocco, is bigger than Morocco, and still this agreement between Morocco, uh, sorry, Ukraine and the EU has worked so that Moroccans don't have to get on a boat anymore so that they can travel freely and legally. But this requires those who need to be sent back have to be sent back. Two more questions from the chat in terms of conclusion and then our time's up today because I would also like to have people feel the curiosity and go and read your book. Now, my first question, there are lots of recommendations for politics, for the ministers of the interior, for political parties. Do you really see a solution here? Will you also be able to convince the parliamentary parties, where do you see the Green Party, since we are representing the foundation of the Green Party here today. And then one of the questions from the chat, what can I do, an individual, the citizen? And please, please, Gerald, be brief. First question, yes, I do talk to lots of politicians. I try to convince them of my proposals. I think one of the biggest hurdles are a lack of deportation realism. There are still lots of people in Europe who are not realistic. Actually, 
many people say that it's not realistic to deport all those who need to be sent back. And secondly, we need a European solution. A solution that involves everybody. I do see lots of problems also with respect to the political parties, but I do accept all invitations, truly. I've talked to lots of people. I talked to a Green member of parliament. I went to Lörrach and talked to a member of the CDU. I'm talking to all parliamentary groups. I'm also talking to the Minister of the Inferior. I was invited by Joseph Borrell last year. I talked to politicians on the European level. I went to Spain. But well, it, it's not sufficient that the biggest NGOs only get involved. I mean, we are big in NGOs, but we do need to convince politicians and they need to be capable of implementing the system because I told you it's dangerous to make promises and then not be able to do what you promise. So I try to tell politicians what concepts there are. And when they invite me, I talk to them. And of course, I do hope that the Green Party members and politicians try and exercise their influence as far as they can so that we get humane borders. I mean, last but not least, you also need the support of the public. But you should never give up your ideals. And that's what we need to bear in mind. There's a pilot project, by the way, of the federal government, of the German government, dealing with resettlement. So we try to, should try and exercise pressure on the parties so that the NEST project is being expanded. We would like to have NEST for. 80 or 100,000 who would like to have a better involvement and more activity on the local level. And concerning the question, what can I do? That's what every one of us can do. Indeed, there are lots of initiatives that you can get involved. There are the cities involved, there is the bridge. You could try and empower these initiatives and groups. Now, let's call it a day. Gerald, and I read the reviews concerning your book, and I would like to quote from one published by the Deutschlandfunk. They said he is realistic, but in order to truly implement his recipes and ideas, you need to be optimistic. True? Absolutely. If you look at Australia, if you look at what happened in the US, in Europe in the last years, you need to be optimistic. And the optimism need to be based on examples. We need to be courageous. And that's why I'm offering lots of examples in my book. I, I try to show systems that have worked already, but you also need to trust you need to trust that it can be done. Otherwise, Germany wouldn't have been able of coping with the situation in 2015 or 16. And there wouldn't have been resettlement programs in the US. And the commission I mentioned before would not have been set up. There were hard times in the past and yet radical ideas for the future were adopted. So you need to be optimistic. But we are not the only ones. There are lots of us. And I'm not German, but I would like to say that Germany has a public debate and has political support in the population for a policy of humane borders. Germany has done lots of things. Germany is credible, credibility based on facts. So Germany could be the beacon I mentioned. 
And last but not least, it also depends on how Germany moves forward, whether it implements the convention today and whether the convention will be important in the next 10 years too. Right. Thank you very much. We're living in difficult times. We see horrible pictures. We are dealing with the pandemic, which makes it even more difficult for refugees and migrants. So thank you very much, Gerald, for this conversation. And I hope that many of our spectators and participants feel inclined to have a look at the book read it, look at the solutions proposals. It's full of wonderful reports and excellent coverage. So a little commercial at the end of this round, the bookstores are still open. So go get and buy it. Today was just meant to be a teaser, was meant to trigger you to furthermore reflect upon the topic. Thank you, Gerald Knaus, for this talk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's stay in touch. And I would like to thank the interpreters too, who have helped us communicate even with people who don't speak German. And of course, I would like to thank Maria Kind and Antonia Neumann for having made this round possible. Stay healthy. All the best. Merry Christmas.